Uh, tell us a bit more about this theory. What's the rationale behind the idea that it could become a seasonal uh, occurrence? Is that to do with temperature, humidity, the number of hours of sunlight in the day? Uh, tell us more. Yeah, so um, we looked at the early spread of uh, COVID-19 uh, throughout the world. And really, once it uh, had started in Wuhan, um, there was some early modeling done by different groups showing uh, just based on travel and uh, uh, links like that, that the next um, epicenter was perhaps going to be in Southeast Asia in countries such as uh, Thailand and cities such as Bangkok. Um, this didn't really happen uh, back in January or February. And instead, the disease or it spread to uh, east, eastwards to uh, South Korea, to Japan, west towards uh, Italy, and also Iran. And this really got us to thinking that maybe uh, this virus was acting in a seasonal manner. So wh what do we mean by that? Um, it, basically, that I look at it as meaning that it has certain temperature and uh, humidity requirements that can aid in its transmission. And so we did find that, at least early on, um, well, most of the locations that were uh, affected uh, all shared uh, uh, low uh, temperatures, average temperatures, and um, low humidity, the kind that's seen uh, basically in the wintertime in temperate areas. So is that why we're seeing countries in Latin America uh, seeing more recent outbreaks of COVID-19 than perhaps uh, uh, more serious than at the beginning of the pandemic across the world? Yeah, I think it explains uh, some of the things we're seeing now, for example, in um, Argentina. Um, also, um, we expect uh, this is a time in, in Southeast uh, Brazil. Brazil's always been a little bit of an outlier. They started uh, really early. But we expect at this time uh, to, to worsen or the conditions uh, to be such that um, transmission will be a lot easier. Also explains uh, South Africa at the moment. Um, but that said, you know, I mean, there's countries that in the wintertime now that are at risk, for example, New Zealand um, or Australia. New Zealand in particular, they have very little cases, almost none, uh, almost no, no new cases. And, and that's been because they've been able to. Um, really control uh, the borders, control uh, their disease. So it, um, what our study describes is areas at high risk, but it also, um, there's a lot of other factors that go into whether um, an area actually will become affected or, or have a significant uh, community transmission. Okay, so it sounds like a, a second wave is therefore inevitable here in the Northern Hemisphere, or, or is it? Is there anything we can be doing now to make sure it isn't an inevitability? Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm certainly concerned about that um, because if you if you stand back and think about it, um, how many cases led to the outbreak in in Milan or in Iran or in any of these places? Um, and now we have a, a, a background uh, level of infection. You just heard uh, Germany, uh, you know, there's a spike in, in cases, that, um, and we know that throughout America, throughout Europe, there's still uh, this background number of cases, and what's going to happen? in the fall and the winter, yeah, I'm definitely concerned about that. It doesn't mean it cannot be stopped. Um, I think the question is, and ultimately is, uh, is, is it going to be manageable or is it going to not be manageable? In other words, can we implement enough public health measures to uh, control it um, when in the fall and the winter time? OK, we're going to have to leave it there. I'd love to ask you more questions, though, uh, but we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohamed Sajadi.